All right, welcome once again to Hardball Conversation. I'm Landon Evanson. We're here with five-time World Series winner Gene Tennis, whom you old schoolers will remember as a key cog for the 70s Dynasty A's teams, but the younger crowd will connect with as the inspiration for Champ Kind's whammy from Anchorman. But so we're all on the same page. Tennis blasted 20 or more home runs five times, led the league in walks twice, and drew 100 or more six times, including no less than 81 from 1973 to 80, was named MVP of the 1972 Fall Classic, played in the 1975 All-Star Game, and retired with a 388 on base percentage. So the man could play. Gino, how are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. Not too bad. You know, uh, Greg Nettles once said that batting average, he felt, was the most overrated statistic in baseball. With power and a penchant for drawn walks, your career seemed to encapsulate that maxim. Is that one you agree with? Totally. I think there's too much emphasis on batting average. You know, you got to win ball games by scoring runs. <laughs> true, true. You know, but the uh, thing is, not everybody can walk. Not everybody has the, you know, the patience and the discipline that it takes to, you know, uh, to walk. So, um, I think a lot of people don't understand the strike zone either. So, I mean, that's part of getting on base percentage is understanding the strike zone and staying within your strength. Daryl Knowles once said there wasn't enough mustard in the world to cover that hot dog when he talked about Reggie Jackson. You played with Reggie, of course, one of the most flamboyant, confident players in the history of the game. With players like Ricky Henderson, Barry Bonds, Manny Ramirez that have come on since, would any of what Mr. October did back in the day even be considered showboating anymore? Oh, no. Those guys can't. Reggie, he's a, he's a butt compared to some of these guys uh, <laughs> in the past several years in the big league. I mean, Reggie was a minor, a, a small a minor uh, stuff he did. I mean, if you get a ball as far as Reggie, I don't care what he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if I, if I was able to hit balls like he did, shoot, I would probably do some crazy things, too, you know, trying to go around the bases. But I tell you, you look at these other guys, they don't know how to style. <laughs> you know, Reggie knew how to style. You know, he'd break it down. He would like Ricky Henderson. You know, Ricky had his own uh, his own style, which was pretty cool too. And they would break it down. They'd take a big old. They take it like a scenic route around the base. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we alluded to it in the open. You were part of Oakland's three consecutive title teams from 1972 to 74. With Catfish Hunter, Ken Holtzman, Vita Blue, Raleigh Fingers at the back end of the bullpen, how would those A's teams fare today? Do you think? Those those teams could compete in any era. It doesn't, you know, I, it doesn't matter what uh, what era you play in. I mean, you look at great teams can play at any time at any time against anybody. Mm -hmm. That's why they were. They're, that's why they're great teams. You win three world championships, you can play against. You can play compete against the, what the 50s, uh, 54, 56 Yankees. I mean, it, you know, and vice versa. I mean, that's just the way we were. I mean, we had great talent. You got pitching and you got good defense and you got guys that can hit, tightly hitting, and guys are clutch hitters. You can play against anybody. Mm -hmm. get any, you know, in any era. It, it, you know, it, when you're good and you're, you're and you win like that and you have a, a feel for winning and you guys make that commitment to win, there's no team. Of course, you can get beat by anybody at any given time. But I'm just mm -hmm. saying, you can compete against it, any club on any any, any at any uh, era. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about it just a little bit just now. But as someone, you won championships. You were also on teams that lost in the postseason. You know, oftentimes you hear fans or even people in the media sometimes talking about the most talented teams should win the World Series. And in a way, you almost didn't, don't get enough credit for it. You know, when Cito Gaston was managing the Blue Jays, a club that you coached for and Brett managed briefly, it was always, you know, they're so good they should win. As someone who's been there, done that, you know, give our listeners an idea. How difficult is it to get to the top of the mountain once, let alone multiple times? Extremely difficult. It's just, it's, uh, it's hard to even express, I mean, how difficult it is because I don't think anybody really can comprehend. I mean, what you got to go through to get there, you, you start out in February. And you got six weeks of spring training, and I mean that's the foundation. It's in spring training, and then you've got to be extremely fortunate not to have any key injuries through the course of the season to keep players. Mm -hmm. And then you got to have guys, you know, having good years, and you got to have guys having uh, better years than they normally have. So you got to have. There's a lot 
lot of intangibles that goes into it uh-huh. that, you know, it's hard to describe because it's, it's such a grinding schedule and uh, such demanding on your body. Uh-huh. And the, the, the trouble with the thing, my philosophy is the reason why guys don't repeat or clubs don't repeat is, you know, the players, once they win, they don't, they don't want to make that sacrifice or that commitment again because it's, it's they're extremely difficult. Huh. Well, they say, you know, they say they will want to win another one, but then again, <laughs> you know, to, to win another one, you got to work harder. For me, you have to work harder to win that second one, yeah. harder to win that third one. You just can't go into spring training and just say, okay, and get complacent and think clubs are going to fall over. Those clubs are going to do everything they can to improve and try to knock you off of that plateau. Uh-huh. So you have to really, you have to step it up another notch, and each time you got to take it up another notch. If you're not willing to, if you're willing just to do what you did the first year, and not and not try to work a little extra, then you're not going to you're not going to win the second one. Uh-huh. Well, we've seen that. The players like someone like Derek Jeter who has that constant drive. It's never enough to have three rings, four rings, five rings. He wants to win it the next year. I mean, that's an individual player. I mean, playing on those A's teams with three straight championships, I mean, did everyone just have that same mentality, or were there times where, you know, you kind of had to police yourselves and get people back on track because maybe they were slipping a little bit? Well, that's the kind of player you want on the club that, you know, that you're putting together as a guy like their Jeter because he possesses, you know, that that winning attitude, and uh, he and he loves to win. I mean, you can see that in him. Mm-hmm. You know, every year he goes out, he's 19, 20 years in the game, and he's had some serious injuries uh, the last couple of years, but he still wants to win. Mm-hmm. And that's what it takes. you got to have that inner drive, you know, and that compassion to compete and, and be up on top of that but though, I mean, there's not too many guys. They talk, they want, they talk about it. But this guy, you watch how he operates and how he prepares himself. Mm-hmm. He goes out there to compete every night. Mm-hmm. Can you go back a little bit like that? Like I talked about with those Oakland teams. I mean, was everyone just always on the same page during those championship years, or were there times where you had to kind of remind people, "Hey, we need to be working a little harder here, focusing a little harder for us to get back to where we want to go." You know what? That's a good question because I don't recall uh, anybody ever saying anything like we got to push ourselves. You know, everybody on that club, you know, wanted to win. I, and I have a feeling a lot of that had to do with Charlie. Yeah. You, know, you know, he made a lot. He, you know, he did a lot of things to, uh, you know, derail us that nobody probably knows about. Just, just stuff that he put in the paper and he would, you know, come in and get on people and, you know, uh, just, just, you know, it's off the wall stuff that he tried to, you know, uh, get our dandruff up. But he had no idea that really that those guys in that clubhouse, how dedicated they were and how much they really wanted to win. So each, we go to spring training after the first one instead of two. 73, we went to spring training with the same kind of mindset. Let's win another one. Uh-huh. Let's, do, let's do this again. It was fun. Everybody enjoyed it. All right, let's start over fresh right here in spring training. Let's let's apply it. Let's apply ourselves to do this again. And that's the same thing we did the second one, and that's the same thing we did the third one. But the key thing is, like I said, if you got four great starters like we had, and then you got you know uh, Raleigh figures out that bullpen with the supporting cast we had, you still have to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was one of the key ingredients is our guys are tremendous athletes, but they kept themselves, you know, healthy. Uh, fortunately for us and everybody uh, in Oakland, but they, they kept themselves healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think any of those guys missed any significant time on a DL, so it's not the starters anyway. Mm-hmm. And then you got your key players with Reggie and, and Rudy and Campy and Bando, you know, mm-hmm. and... Uh, those guys had consistent years, you know. And the thing is, if nobody really talks about our club, is we could execute fundamentals with anybody. Mm-hmm. And that's the one uh, thing that kind of I get kind of disappointed in because they just look at our pitching and then they look at, you know, what Reggie did, you know. Yeah. If you look at our, if you watched us play, if you got a team, and if we were one run up or we were tied in the seventh inning, you are going to be this, not consistently be this. 
<laughs> we didn't make mistakes. We didn't make mistakes. We executed, you know, about anything on the field we could execute. When it got the seventh inning on, if you didn't have us out, out by then, you weren't going to be this more like. You can talk about it a little earlier here. Being in Minnesota, as we were joking about a little last week, you know, we've been spoiled having a catcher who's been as insanely productive as Joe Maurer has been. Of course, now he's moved on to play first base. But as someone who took the beating behind the plate and still produced offensively, do you think players like Yadier Molina and Buster Posey get as much credit as they should for putting up the numbers that they do despite going back there and catching every day? That's really, you know, those guys are, for me, are special people because, uh, yeah, they, uh, they're they great athletes, you know, and I think most players are up to the big as are athletes, but these guys are are very unique kind of players. I know what it took, it took to be a catcher. He takes a lot out of your body. Mm-hmm. And you take a guy like Molina, and I had Molina when I was with the Cardinals. He was a 19-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. And for him to continue to perform defensively, and then all of a sudden, you know, the last three or four years, he's starting to figure out how to hit. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's... You know, it's just another intangible for him. I mean, this kid's a Hall of Fame. This kid's a Hall of Fame catcher for me. If he can stay healthy, he'll be in the Hall of Fame. This kid. Mm-hmm. And you took a Posey. Now Posey had that some serious injury blocking that play. Mm-hmm. Now they might have to think about moving him out of there eventually because it's gonna. When you break a leg or you tear a knee up, it's just a matter of time. It, you know what? That's gonna start affecting you. Mm-hmm. But you, you, when you break something, it's never, it's never the same. <laughs> Your body's never the same. Right. That area is never the same because you can never. Once you tear something up, you can never, you can fix it, and you can, you know, and move on. And you, but that that area is never the same as it was before you tore it up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those guys are, you know, I, I don't think Molina will move unless he gets, you know, uh, towards the end he might. Uh, either go to first base or who knows he might end up on the American League at DH but uh, yeah. you maybe catch a couple of days a week but you can pose the, I would say probably in the next five years we'll probably have to consider moving him but if they want his offense I mean it's going to affect you somewhat but it doesn't seem to be balling up two guys right now mm-hmm. you know now that most teams carry 12 and sometimes 13 pitchers do you think the game is lacking that old chess match it used to have? Where, I mean, just because it seems like managers are limited in the options they have off the bench late in the game? No question. I mean, to me, it's ridiculous carrying 13 pitchers in the big leagues. And it tells you really exactly why they do it. I mean, I know why they do it. I mean, the starters can't go more than five innings. Right. You know, so, right. so that's the problem right there is your starting pitchers can't go more than five innings. You're lucky to get five innings out of a guy, and then you got to go to the bullpen. The both teams are just, are set up for the from the bull. They set the bullpen up before they set the rotation up. You know? Right, right. You know, so that I means you look at seven, eight guys in the bullpen. You're gonna be kidding me. You know, back in our day, you know, we had four man rotations. Mm-hmm. These guys got five man rotations, and they still can't go seven, eight innings. <laughs> but you know, you got more. You got more. You got thirty clubs now. Mm-hmm. You know, and guys are breaking down. They're blowing their elbows out. There's more st- Tommy John surgeries happening. I should have, I should have been in a stinking orthopedic surgeon <laughs> with, <all laughs> with all this stinking injury. The kid got again from Tampa last night. He probably tore out his uh, elbow. Yeah. You know, but it, you look at all the injuries in spring training. I've never seen so many injuries just in spring training. Spring training, man, you know, it's not the seventh game in the World Series. You're supposed to get in shape. Right. These guys are down there blowing arms out. <laughs> I've never seen nothing like that in my life. You know, I know yeah. you get all these people talking all the time now about the way they're managing pitchers and, you know, the, they have more knowledge now than they had 30, 40 years ago, whatever, and, and they're – they're just more wary of taking care of someone's arm, taking care of their investment. You know, guys like, I look at Catfish Hunter and Vita Blue, they were just as important to their team as Steven Strasburg is to the Nationals. And it just seems odd, just like you talked about a little bit. Do you remember any kind of injury plague they had through in, say, the 70s, where pitchers were going down with these elbow injuries all the time as they are now? No. I never heard. I never, well, uh, I guess... Uh... Colfax had a elbow injury. That's what took him out. His career ended, you know. Yeah. 
and nobody even knew about it. They didn't know about uh, the rotator cuff. Or if you got a bad arm, you can't pitch. You're done. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was back in those days. Mm -hmm. But you know, now they, you know, everybody got to see the shoulder, the rotator cuff, or it's the elbow, and mm -hmm. they, they probably get a better chance fixing the elbow, the tendon, than they do the rotator cuff. Not too many guys are successful in coming back from the rotator cuff yeah. like they are at the, with the elbow tendon. So, yeah. but you know, you look at guys, and I and, and I have my own theories on all the all the why all these injuries are, are occurring. You know, is I just think there's for me, you look at back in our days, you know, the guys pitch nine innings, they throw a hundred pitches. Mm -hmm. Kids nowadays are throwing a hundred pitches in five innings. Mm -hmm. They won't throw strikes, <laughs> number one. And the, and the hitting has gotten to the point, the mindset with the hitting is work the pitchers. Uh -huh. You know, you look at all the hitters, and, and the, there's more strikeouts now in baseball than, than ever in history. Right. It's because pick, hitters are taking too many hittable pitches because the mindset is to work the pitcher. You know, mm -hmm. get him out, get him out. So why, if that, if you got a bullpen of eight guys, why are you trying to get the starter out here so early? <laughs> because there's strengths in the bullpen. <laughs> right. I, right. I never, I never figured that out. But you know, here's, you know, you look at these guys; they're afraid to throw strikes. These pitchers, mm -hmm. they get o two. Next thing you know, it's three two. Mm -hmm. They keep nibbling and nibbling. They don't know how to take a hitter out, and and the hitters go up there. With, and they take pitches, and then all of a sudden, now they got to hit a a pitcher's pitch, and there's not any success in that. So they they strike out 200 times a year. That's just, that's just mind boggling. Maybe a hitter strike out 200 times a year. Yeah. And I, yeah. You, know, you look at Dunn, and you look at that kid. I think led the league last year, Carter from Houston. He punched out over 200 times. Yeah. It's a lot of a lot of swinging and missing. I mean, it's just it's embarrassing. That would be embarrassing for me to punch out 200 times a year. Mm -hmm. and, and not doing much damage than he's doing as far as, uh, I don't know, he hit, what, 24 home runs. But if you punch it out 200 times, you better hit 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. You know, 50 and you better drive in 120. I mean, then maybe we can live with those punch outs. But you're hitting, you're hitting 24 home runs and you're driving in 70 some runs and you're punching out over 200. There's a problem somewhere. You know, when you think about the pitchers back in our day, you know, our four starters, and you look at Baltimore's, they had four 20 game winners, and, mm -hmm. and then you know, and it just goes on. All, all clubs back in those days had at least a couple of good quality starters. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, uh, even Minnesota had great pitching. You had to go in there and face, uh, you know, uh, Perry, and you had to face Bly Levin, and then. You know, all those guys, you'd be kidding me. But they had great pitching. Mm -hmm. So it was tough back in the early 70s, 69, early 70s. They were tough, you know, when Killebrew was there and Tony Oliva and mm -hmm. Carew and all those guys. I mean, they had a good team. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the pitching, to me, is just, uh, it's just you know, they're just babysitting these pitchers. They're just kind of, you know, uh, they try not to overstand it, but they're still blowing out on a regular basis. So something's wrong somewhere. I think my personal opinion, I think the weights is, is causing a lot of these injuries. Oh, okay. You know, you know, and, and I really believe that because if you look back in our day, we never lifted weights. Mm -hmm. And you look at the kids now, they got personal trainers. <laughs> right. You know, and you look at the arms being blown out from spring training to now, we were, only, we're not even two weeks into the season and pitchers are dropping. Mm-hmm. You know, we just talked about, you know, some ways that maybe the game's a little worse than it's been in the past. What's a way the game today is better than when you played? The technology in the game is, you know, we don't, you know, you can, the films are, that, that these guys have in clubhouses uh, to be able to see the pitcher and see what you did against this pitcher. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, say you face a guy like, uh, say, Roger Clemens and, and next thing you know, you're, uh, 10 days later, you're facing him in your park. You go and be, they put that film on the thing when he did it 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. And so you can get a, an idea how he's going to attack you. We never had that that luxury. You know? Mm -hmm. You just had to keep it in your head or you had to take notes on what how he got you out and what he threw you in certain situations. But now these, these players, they got 
they got technology right at their fingertips, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just, you, know, if you can't play with that kind of knowledge. I mean, that's like, a, it's not cheating, but it's giving you an extra an advantage. Mm-hmm. You know? So that is big for me as far as uh, the hitting aspect. Mm-hmm. You'll get all the strikeouts. <laughs> Yes, you do. But, you, know, you know, as far as the game, you know, it's uh, they're trying to change the game now. You got the instant replay, and now you got blocking the plate thing. That's a joke for me. But uh, you know, I don't know. You just you can't put these guys in in, in bubbles. You know, you can, mm-hmm. it's a bait. It's a it's a sport. Somebody somebody's gonna get hurt. If there, it's, every sport has a technique. If you teach the kids the proper way to block the plate, you're going to eliminate a lot of injuries. Somebody's going to get hurt of it sooner or later. Mm-hmm. You know, just it's just the nature of, of sports. You're going to get hurt if you're in a bad position. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I caught a long time, and I never tore a leg up, and never had a concussion, mm-hmm. to my knowledge. You know, <laughs> yeah, too. But, uh, right. Because back then you didn't know if you had a concussion or not. But, you know, but, you know, it's just, you know, the t- technique is causing injuries. You know, just bad. You know, here's the problem with that, and that's the reason, I, you know, I'll get to that, because these kids are fast-forwarded to the big leagues, so they're not spending enough time in the minor leagues because mm-hmm. of the economics to learn how to play the game and learn the techniques on, you know, how to protect yourself and how to keep the game, slow the game down. Mm-hmm. So they're being taught how to play the game. Most of these kids are being taught how to play the game on a major league level. Right, and it's and it can really speed up on you up there, and you and you can get out of control, you know. And that's what happens with a lot of injuries, and maybe you know the young pitchers blowing arms out as, you know, they're trying to, because they're fast forwarded because of the economics of the game is forced in these clubs, you know, to go sit, get these kids, their kids to the big leagues quicker. Mm-hmm. Because they can't, they can't compete out there in the open market for players like maybe four or five teams can. Right, right. You know, I, I have to ask you because I uh, mean you know, it's such a cultural phenomenon now. Uh, Anchorman. Have you seen this movie? You know what? I did not see that movie. I saw just the part that uh, the first part, just because my wife and my kids they put it on. Before, uh, <laughs> he mentioned my name, but I didn't watch the movie. I'm not quite into, you know, I know his, his humor. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered, though, is this something that they just decided to use your name for what they were doing, or did they ever contact you and ask you if that was okay, or did that just happen? No, I never heard from anybody. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know how they went about picking my name out. <laughs> Do you ever get any uh, grief from old teammates or anything, talking about being in Hollywood now and all that kind of thing? No, no, I don't even think anybody. Well, you know, when I was coaching uh, in the minor leagues with the Cardinals, you know, a lot of my kids, my players, they they watch all kind of movies, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were they were always uh, get, getting on me and stuff. But the players that I played with never even said a word to me. I don't even think they saw it either. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's fair enough. He brings a different type of humor to the table than what I'm really kind of not really into. <laughs> he looks like a great guy, though, personally, but I'm just not into his kind of, kind of comedy. Yeah, it's definitely an acquired taste, Will Ferrell's humor. So, uh, But uh, other than that, what keeps you busy these days? What are you doing out in Oregon? Nothing. I'm retired. I do a little golfing. I do a little fishing. And now I'm just starting to, uh, the weather's starting to get a little better. We had 75 degrees yesterday here. And Today's supposed to be 70. So I got some yard work. I got to get started, get ready for everything to start growing. I got the water turned on yesterday. So that's that's the usually that's the key thing. When you get your water pump turned on, then, you, then I start uh, getting all the dead grass out of my yard and get it aerated, <laughs> get it fertilized, and get the water pumped into it. So we're not too far away from real summer yeah. here. But we still got winter though. We still got next. We got the rest of this month. We could have six inches of snow here probably in a week from now. <laughs> yeah, well, like you never know. Like I'm, Minnesota, well, not quite like Minnesota, but it could happen. You know, you could be sunny one day and then you get four inches of snow the next. Yeah, we had that uh, last week going on. There it was uh, about 56 degrees, really nice. And you look at the weather the next day; it's supposed to be in the upper 30s, and we're expecting a little bit of snow. It's 
Oh, it just seems cool. like the winter will never go away. <clears throat> so it's kind of like it out here. I mean, we still are in the winter. We're not in the well, it's not a full blown out summer yet. We're still in the winter here. Mm -hmm. We'll be in the winter into May. You know, we really don't really get to decent real weather consistently until June, sometime middle of June. Hmm. Yeah, it's probably gonna be a similar case for us over here. It's been a lot of fun. We really appreciate you taking some time. All right, you're running the pole monitor, so am I so low. <laughs> I will do that. Thanks, Gene. All right.